it's time to finally address the elephant in the room, and that elephant is the analog pocket. Uh, so this is kind of a, a complex device, and I think it requires a little bit of background knowledge before I can I can accurately give you my opinion on it, because that's ultimately all this video is going to be my opinion on this device, uh, which I'm, I'm going to sum it up for you so you don't even have to watch the, the whole thing here. It's a good device if that's what you're into, um, but you know who you are. I highly recommend this for anyone considering a similarly specced Game Boy. So, you know, you already have your game collection, your physical, actual hardware game collection. Um, and, you know, maybe you still have a Game Boy from back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Or, you know, maybe you don't even have a Game Boy anymore and you're considering buying a, or commissioning a Game Boy. If you can get one of these, yeah, this is, this is a hell of a good deal. Um, I, I, but I, I think that's the key there. I think it's, it's a good deal and, you know, maybe even a good buy for anyone who's playing off of physical hardware games that they already own. If you don't already own the games, or if you're planning on using a flash cart with it, it's not so good to buy. Um, but I'll delve into that more uh, a little bit later. I have this whole video outlined, and I'm going to be scrolling through some notes as I... Uh, as I go through this, because I want to make sure I hit all the talking points that I had discovered while I was playing around with this thing. So, let's get started. Um, this is how it arrives. If you order one, it's just, you know, very simple, plain box. That's kind of kind of their thing, minimalism. Um, it's a lot easier to open when you've got an analog pocket in there. But, in the box is... A USB cable, a couple stickers, and a little um, QR code link to the uh, quick start guide. And one of the stickers they gave you is this FPGA logo that they've trademarked, by the way, and their analog logo. Um, neat little stickers. No idea what I'm going to use them for. Probably nothing. In all honesty, they're probably just going to sit in this box until... I don't know. Probably indefinitely. Um... And the USB cable it comes with is a USB-C to C cable. So if we pop that out there, you get a uh, delicious little snack bag. These things are, uh, don't eat it, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, you just get a little C to C cable. I have no idea what, if anything, this cable supports. Like, I don't know if it's just a USB 2.0 cable with Type-C connectors on it, or if it's, you know, 3.0 or even, like, Thunderbolt compatible. I doubt it. I sincerely doubt it. Um, but I'm just going to leave it in the box because at this point I have enough USB cables uh, that one extra is actually going to do absolutely nothing for me. Um, and then here is the device itself. It fits in the box very neatly, and if I didn't have a game in there, it'd sit flat and it'd be kind of a pain in the butt to get out. Uh, but, you know, the first thing I see, you know, the first thing I notice when I grab this thing is just how absolutely huge it is. Uh, so, I mean, they, they've always been pretty upfront about the size of the thing. Like, it's, it's never been a mystery how big this thing is going to be. The thing is, is though, when you compare it to Game Boys, the screen to body ratio makes it look like it's going to be a lot smaller than it is because, you know, you're used to Game Boys and they're teeny tiny screens. Um, what you don't realize from the pictures is that this thing has an absolutely massive screen and the whole thing is just absolutely massive. Uh, so for context, here is my slate next to the darn thing. If I, if I line them up on the bottom, you can see there is a solid inch of extra analog. Uh, if we take a look at the side, you can see it's quite, quite a bit thicker. By the way, the bottoms are totally lined up. So yeah, it's, it's a big boy. Uh, if we compare this to the original Game Boy, which I neglected to have at my desk, um, it's basically the same size, just a little bit thinner, which, you know, if that's what you're into, all right, that's fine. They're, uh, there you go. Basically the same uh, height and width-wise. Um, 
actually I'd say they're the exact same height and exact same width. The only real difference is uh, the thickness and the analog is it's quite a bit thinner than the original Game Boy. But um, y you look at it and you think it's the size of a Game Boy Pocket just based off of the the uh, proportions of the thing. But if we uh, boot that up there, turn on the Game Boy, you can see, you know, right away, big difference in screen size. Uh, but we'll come back to that later. Set it back to sleep for now. Um, yeah, I guess another good example is if we put the DMG in the analog box, it, it basically fits, aside from the fact that this has no cutout uh, where the game goes, so it doesn't quite fit with the cable. Oh, and there's those really good cutouts. It doesn't matter. You get it. Um, if we pop the slate in there, you can even see, you know, emphasize the size of this thing. Um, let us look at, because I... I know you guys are going to ask, so I might as well start off. Um, similarly shaped Game Boys, other mods like Zypher's Slab or Boxy Pixels Unhinged. Um, Boxy Pixels Game Boy is actually a, a little, just a hair thicker than the analog pocket, depending on where you measure from. Uh, if we don't count the buttons, uh, then Boxy Pixels is thicker. If we do count the buttons, then they're about the same. Uh, but you see, it's still got that little bit extra along the top, and it is a little bit wider, as you can see there. But thickness, man, they're basically identical. Um, Zypher's slab, on the other hand, is significantly shorter, uh, but also, again, thicker, surprisingly. Um, I, I don't know what what it is, why people want these thick consoles so badly. Um, I went in a completely different direction with my slate and made it just about as thin as we can we can do it. Uh, if I put that at a side angle, you can see how much thicker the pocket is. I have them aligned on the back here. Um, I don't know. I mean, if that's what you're into, if you're into a, a, a thick boy holding it, then yeah, sure, this is... Probably a better, a better idea than some of the other Game Boy mods. Um, but personally, I don't mind thin stuff like this. In fact, I'd use a Game Boy Micro just about everywhere if I could. Um, I, I I don't know. The size doesn't bother me. I, I rather like the size. Uh, of course, you know this one only runs Game Boy Advance games. But we'll we'll get into that a little bit more later. Let me uh let me get back to my outline and and stop getting distracted. I I just wanted to go over the size and you know initial impressions there. Um because I figure that's probably what you guys are most interested in. So let's get down to the uh, actual content that I had intended to go in this video and uh let's talk about let's talk about a little bit more what this thing is hardware-wise. So Analog's thing, you know, what, what they do is they make old game consoles, uh, but they remake all of the hardware inside of them. So Game Boys, you know, you track down a Game Boy, whether it be Slate, Micro, whatever, um, you know, they're all going to be running original Nintendo Silicon. They're all going to have, you know, Game Boy Advance CPU if it's Game Boy Advance. Uh, they're can have Game Boy Color or whatever. It's, you know, 20 year old silicon at this point, maybe even 25 to 30 years, depending on uh, how old you get. Um, analog comes along and says, look, we're not going to use any of that old stuff. We've got FPGAs these days that are powerful enough that we can take what we know about the original silicon and re implement it into a modern chip. Um, now, for those that don't know what FPGAs are, they're field programmable gate arrays. They're special, um, you know, com computer chips, basically like this. This is a NAND module, not a FPGA, but same basic thing. Um, you get the idea. But you can take this, the FPGA, and you can program it with your own custom code instead of something like original silicon that is, you know, this is made at the factory, and if you need to update or change anything on it, that you need to have a new one made. Uh, FPGAs are more um, flexible because they are field programmable, which means you can 
more or less tell them to do whatever the heck you want, assuming you can write the code for that. Now, that is one of the key features because an FPGA is only as good as the code running it. Um, it's not to say that the code running this thing is bad, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. So Analog took that idea and they ran with it and they made their first portable console. Everything before this has been like Super Nintendo, uh, Sega Genesis, uh, stuff like that, but their own version of it with their own brand new hardware and FPGAs and, and custom code to run the games and such. Um, but they took that idea and ran with it and decided to make a Game Boy, except this Game Boy also runs Game Gear games, Neo Geo Pocket and Neo Geo Pocket Color games, Atari Lynx games, and TurboGrafx-16 games. Uh, now those latter three, the Neo Geo Pocket Color, Lynx, and TurboGrafx, uh, those all require um, uh, uh, like dongle adapters that you plug into the cart slot and those have not released yet. In fact, I don't even know if they're in the firmware. There's certainly no settings I can mess around with at the time of this video, uh, which for reference, it's April 6th and the firmware version is 1.0b. Uh, Game Gear, on the other hand, also requires a dongle adapter. That looks to be already out, but good luck buying one. Uh, everything on the analog site is back ordered until next year for the most part. Um, it, it's neat. It's hella ambitious, but it's hella neat. Um, they, they give you this solid hardware platform and then give it enough compatibility that you can run pretty much any handheld game on it. And the best part is, you know, you plug in your actual carts. I mean, it's a bad example because I have a flash cart in the Jesus thing, but we're testing something live. We'll come back to that. Um, so yeah, their FPGA re-implementations, it's pretty neat when done well. Um, and what's especially neat about the Analog Pocket in particular is that if you were buying a Game Boy with the same feature set, uh, you'd be putting a lot of extra hardware into it. And as I've, I, I've, I don't know if I've actually explicitly said this before on my channel, um, but I've explained this before on, on in uh, Discord, uh, chatting with people, and, and Game Boys, for the most part, I like to use the metaphor, that I say they have a power envelope. Uh, that is to say, um, their power systems are only designed to handle so much, specifically a stock Game Boy, and the more mods you add to it, the more strain you're putting on that envelope, till eventually it just can't handle it anymore. But uh, my point is, Analog Pocket contains a lot of the mods stock that people would be doing to Game Boys normally. So, for example, we have this fully laminated IPS screen, which is a thing now that Game Boy mods uh, are doing specifically for Game Boy Color at the very least. Um, fully laminated IPS screen, stock. USB Type-C port for charging, stock. Uh, rechargeable battery, stock. That sort of thing. Uh, so what I like about it is if you can get one at MSRP, which at the moment is 220 US plus another 20 in shipping plus whatever taxes, um, we'll call it 250. Um, th this is actually cheaper than the modded Game Boy. Um, if we're starting with an SP, you know, these things are up to like 55 bucks right now stock before you get a screen, um, a case mod, which... Specifically, if you're interested in a slate, SP screen and case mod are going to be more than the uh, analog pocket. End of story. That's even before popping a new battery in it um, and whatever other mods you might do. I think that's actually more or less the same feature set if we're just talking about the bare pocket, not the dock and anything else. But anyway, moving on before I linger and ramble too much. Um, it, it, it's pretty neat. If you get the dock for one of these things, uh, plugs in via HDMI, it's basically a switch dock, but for the analog pocket. It does all the same stuff. You plug it in, you can connect up wireless controllers or even wired um, outputs via HDMI. It's pretty neat. I don't have one. I couldn't get one. They're being scalped to hell right now. Um, we'll circle back to that in a year or so, probably. Uh, but anyway, I want to talk about 
one other thing. If we take a look at their website as of today, uh, this is April 6th still, um, analog, go to the pocket page. It's still up for pre-order. You can't buy one. You can, uh, well, I say you can't buy one and there's an add cart button right there. Uh, but if you look at the estimated ship date, you know, Filament Group C 2023, I can't buy one this year. Um, it's the same with all their accessories and everything. Uh, but that, that wasn't what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at the page here. Uh, it looks the exact same on desktop. There's no extra or missing content or anything like that. Uh, but I wanted to draw attention to this. No emulation. Um, I think that is incredibly misleading. And believe it or not, I think it's actually been harmful to the FPGA development ecosystem. Um, they are technically correct, but only technically correct. They're more incorrect than they are correct, in my opinion. Uh, the problem with that statement, no emulation, is when you say your console doesn't use emulation, you're implying that emulation is inherently bad, and that's not true. Bad emulation is bad, but not all emulation is bad emulation. Um, a lot of the, the key factors for good emulation are high accuracy, uh, minimal input lag, um, hardware compatible, well, hardware compatibility, like game compatibility and such. Um, and if you have all three of those things in a system, you get good emulation. Uh, and I'd say the analog pocket does that. It gets the hardware compatibility pretty damn good. Uh, there are some issues with this card slot and how it's designed. It won't take some special cards. We'll circle back to that. Um, the actual like software compatibility though is fantastic. Aside from physical lockout problems, like good luck trying to plug an e-reader into this thing, it has run every single thing that I've thrown at it with no noticeable issues. And that's, that's a big thing. I think that is incredible. I think that is very, very good. Uh, input lag, I didn't notice any problems with it, but I also don't have the tools to measure it properly. Uh, I did a guesstimate measurement uh, with the tools that I do have, and if my method is working as I think it should be, then this console might actually have less input lag than an IPS modded Game Boy. I will revisit that sometime in the future no guarantees soon, but it is on my list. I'd love to check out input lag on this compared to like an IPS modded Game Boy and a stock Game Boy, stuff like that. I think it'd be really neat. Um, and yeah, like I said, the accuracy is great. I, I threw synthetic benchmarks at the thing and it passed every single one after updating. On the launch firmware, it did have compatibility issues, but after updating to 1.0b, seems to have solved all my issues. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm digging it. Um, let me scroll through my notes here. I just got through a page here. So yeah, I, I, I said, I said that the no emulation thing is a bit of a marketing wank. I think that's not exactly true because this is a hardware emulator. Um, we have to, we have to look at the term emulator and determine what we want that to mean. If we want it to mean that, um, you know what? No, I'm not even going to go there. This is just, I'm, I'm already going to piss people off enough by saying that this hardware simulator is emulation. It, it is. It's a hardware emulator. This is emulating a Game Boy. If I wasn't using this, I would be using this. I can plug a cart into this and I can plug a cart into this and they do the same thing. Therefore, this is a Game Boy emulator. Uh, but like I said, it's not all that bad. There, there's a lot of um, associations with the word emulation that don't necessarily apply to this. Um, I briefly glossed over input lag, uh, which is more or less, uh, imagine you're playing some platforming game like Mario, for instance. Um, input lag is the time it takes from when you hit the jump button to when you see you, your character jump on screen. Now, in most 
consoles, I believe that's around a frame. And that is about what I tested here. Now, some emulation platforms, uh, like if you're just running an emulator on your computer, the input lag can be higher because the um, because of how the emulator is processing inputs. This is using a real-time operating system, which doesn't have to uh, doesn't have to deal with hardware cues. I'm forgetting the specific terminology, uh, but basically it uses interrupts and it sends the input more or less as soon as it happens. Whereas on your computer, you have to go through the USB stack and then get it queued in the processors, so on and so forth. It's, there are a bunch of little steps and they all add up. Um, now at the end of the day, it's still only a few MS, but it's not always a few MS. Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's 20. It all depends on which specific cycle you hit it at. Um, in, input lag's a thing that I could talk about all day but have never really talked about because I haven't had the tools to measure it properly but so yeah I, I I'd love to circle back on that um, eventually when I get better testing equipment more suitable for that uh, but needless to say in my extremely rudimentary measurements the input lag was less on this than it was on for example that and this is an actual Game Boy with actual Nintendo silicon in it. But the thing is, is we have the Game Boy running into an FPGA running into a screen. Whereas this, everything's running off that single FPGA. We don't have two, two well, we do have two FPGAs communicating with each other, but that's, that's different. Um, one, <laughs> one of them is communicating directly with the screen, more or less. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Um, one of the special things about this particular implementation, uh, this is not the first thing that you can just like drop a cart into, and that's a bad example of a cart, but this is not the first thing that you can just drop a cart into and start playing games. This is one of the first, um, or at least it's the first done well that actually plays hardware off of the cart, or games off of the cart. Uh, a lot of other devices, like specifically this epilogue, um, what is it called, GB operator, and the Hyperkin Retron SQ specifically. I did a video on that thing a long while back. It's a pile of junk. But anyway, um, these things operate by dumping the game into the system memory and then running it out of memory. So, for instance, if I were to start a game on this thing, perfect example there, uh, Kirby Tilt and Tumble. If I start Kirby Tilt and Tumble on this thing, it's going to read the game and then load it into memory, which means were the emulator not programmed to quit when I remove it, I could just pop the game out and keep playing willy-nilly. And for this game in particular, that is a problem because this game relies upon gyro sensor, which is in the cart. So if you dump the game, it is no longer communicating with the hardware in the cart. Thus, this game doesn't work. However, on the analog pocket, it's playing directly off of the cart, which means if I pop this game in the pocket, I can play it with the gyro, no problem. It's fantastic. Um, but, I mean, that, that does come with some downsides, depending on uh, your, your point of view. If you're familiar with Game Boy hardware, this isn't really a downside, uh, but it is worth considering because modern consoles work entirely different. So on a Game Boy, your game ecosystem is the physical cart. Uh, if it saves data at all, that saved data lives on the cart. You can take this cart, put it into any Game Boy, and pick up exactly where you left off. The downside is, if you lose this cart, you also lose your save data. Um, I mean, that's probably going to seem pretty darn obvious to most of you guys watching this video, but it's, it's an important distinction, because something like... For example, a Nintendo Switch, um, yes, this thing still uses physical carts, but the game essentially runs off the cart but lives off the console. So if I were to take this game out and pop it in another console, it'd be like I'm starting fresh because my save data is on this console. And in this particular instance, yes, I know there's cloud save data. It's not supported by that game. Um, I, I think that's an important distinction because... You can take this cart and, you know, let's say you don't have a dock. 
we can just plug this cart into a consoleized Game Boy or like a Game Boy player and play off that and pick up exactly where we left off without having to dock this thing. Um, I think I think that's a neat feature, but it is it is something to be aware of just in case. Because um, I don't know, I figure a lot of people who are looking at an analog pocket might not necessarily be hardcore Game Boy fans, or maybe they're the most hardcore Game Boy fans. But I feel like it's a mixture. So I think it's worth worth understanding. Um, so I guess that leads me to my next section here, uh, which is what the analog pocket is not. So, like I said, that no emulation tag, we're, we're going to keep coming back to that particular piece of marketing quite a bit. Uh, but that no emulation tag on any other piece of hardware would imply that it is a hardware clone. The analog pocket's not that either. They have taken the hardware apart to the barest level possible and then re-implemented that with their own hardware. Other hardware clones, <coughs> cough, cough, uh, Revo K101, as they say. I, I thought I proved that this wasn't a hardware clone either, but most people think of hardware clone, they think of this thing. Um, this... Yeah, it's not a hardware clone. We'll get more into that later, too. <laughs> uh, you can't have it both ways, you know? It's, it's either a hardware clone or it's an emulator. Anyway. Uh, it's a bare metal re-implementation, uh, which means we aren't running this in an operating system. So when I plug my Game Boy cart in, it is... The, the FPGA inside this thing is directly interfacing with my game and running it directly off the cart. We don't have um, we don't have different layers of access. It does mean that if I remove the cart, my game stops working. But that's it's kind of how that works. You know, you remove the storage device on which your game is stored, then the game is no longer accessible. Um, unlike hardware clones, FPGAs. Uh, We'll go back to that beginning definition where I reminded you guys that FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays. It means this thing's actually updatable. So when they find a bug, they just patch that bug in the code that they've written and then issue a firmware update. And it works. They've already done that at least a couple times. Uh, I know when I first got it, it came with uh, GBA BIOS version 1.4. Now it has GBA BIOS version 1.5. And coincidentally, some of the bugs I encountered on the release version are no longer present. Who'd have guessed? Uh, you can't do that with a hardware clone, and you can't do that with actual hardware. If there are any bugs in this hardware design, and I guarantee you there are, they're there for life. You can't do anything about it. You can release a revised model, but then you break compatibility depending on the nature of the bug. Uh, so in a way, this is a lot better. Unfortunately, it means the hardware itself is a little bit more expensive because at scale, FPGAs are more expensive than custom silicon. Um, you got to keep in mind the scale, though. You know, if you're moving 100,000 units, it probably makes sense to have your own chips designed. If you're moving a couple thousand, maybe not so much. I have no idea how many analog is moving, but if we judge their uh, order numbers, I think they're somewhere around like 10,000 pockets, which doesn't probably doesn't make sense to have their own uh, silicon designed. And even if it did, they wouldn't be able to update it, so they're better off with the FPGAs, I think. Um, I don't know exactly what the break-even point is. That might be something worth looking into, but that's that's another another topic for discussion. Uh, another thing, this is not this is not a hypervisor, so we aren't running an operating system on the bare metal that is then running the emulator core. The emulator core runs directly on bare metal with just enough of an operating system to actually interface with the hardware. Uh, the operating system on this thing we call an RTOS or a real-time operating system, and literally all it exists for is to help interface the hardware with the software. Uh, with the game that's running with the end user. That's it. Um, there's even times where you might hit a button on the OSD and it's not captured because the actual emulator core is doing something and you need to wait for that input to be processed. 
Um, I've seen that a couple times on this device where I'll bring up the on-screen display and try and change a setting, and I'll hit a button, but the button isn't captured, and then I have to hit the button again for it to accept my changes or go into a submenu or something. Um, and I've only ever noticed that in the OSD itself, when you're playing a game, the button responses are 100% every single time. It, well, okay. Not every game responds to a random button input, but the game is receiving the button input and choosing to ignore it because you can't skip that cutscene. <laughs> Stuff like that. You, you know what I'm trying to get at. Um, a hypervisor system, uh, for an example, would be running Nintendon't on the Wii to run GameCube games. Uh, it can work extremely well, uh, but there are some, there are a few problems with that specific implementation, um, one of them being accuracy. Uh, but again, that comes down to the ability of the coder, not necessarily the implementation itself. But I digress. Let's move on. Um, another thing, the analog pocket is not, it is not perfect. There are problems with it, uh, and I will talk more in detail about that in a few moments, uh, but one of the biggest things that I ran into is that the emulation was not, at the time I wrote my notes, it was not 100%. There were some bugs with some games. Uh, I couldn't find any specifically with what I played, but I also didn't play every 1,100 and something odd games that came out for Game Boy Advance. Oh god, I, I'm just counting Game Boy Advance. I didn't even count Game Boy and Game Boy Color. I played like a dozen games, uh, and then I ran synthetic benchmarks, and it failed those synthetic benchmarks. It's since been updated, and it passes all of those synthetic benchmarks now, but I am fairly confident um, a more skilled Game Boy uh, hardware architecture person uh, could write a test that a real Game Boy can pass and the analog pocket will fail, uh, just as a matter of uh, memory timings or some weird quirk with the CPU that's not quite properly re-implemented. Um, if you wanted to go so far, the Game Boy Color in particular has a problem with the audio uh, subsystem in that it's quite noisy. Uh, if you turn on a Game Boy Color, turn the volume all the way up, and you're in a particular po part of a game that doesn't make noise, you can hear, you know, little buzzes depending on what the CPU is doing specifically. Analog Pocket doesn't do that. Sorry guys, you have better audio. <laughs> but anyway, let's move on. That is, that is the objective stuff. Let's talk about the subjective stuff. Um, why this is a good device. Uh, not necessarily why I like it, but why analog making this thing I think is good for the um, good for the niche um, from a preservation standpoint this means I can play any Game Boy or Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance game without having to track down a 20 year old Game Boy and potentially repair that Game Boy I could just buy a new device that plays these games um, from a game preservation standpoint it is very solid uh, on that same note, if you've ever played with an original Game Boy, you know it's not the best experience, which is probably how you found my channel in the first place, watching me do IPS mods, for example, putting a better screen in the darn things. Um, this this re-implements that. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, input lag. We do add input latency uh, two Game Boys when we put an IPS screen in them. That's just how it works. The CPU is designed to output with one specific screen, and once we change that screen out, we can't reprogram the Game Boy CPU. Like I said, it's it's hardware, you know? There's no updates to this. The update is to buy a new chip, which Nintendo stopped making. Um, that's where this thing comes into play. But if we add a new screen to this thing, what we need to do is we need to add another FPGA in between the Game Boy CPU and the LCD itself to get the two to talk to each other. Because this is only designed to talk to one specific LCD, not this one in particular, but y you get what I'm trying to say here. That's a better example. Don't 
don't complain. Don't cancel me for not knowing my Game Boy and Game Boy screens. Um, you'd need another FPGA in there, which adds another step to the chain, which adds input lag. Um, most of the backlight kits work with a frame buffer, which means you're adding at least one frame of lag. Analog Pocket does not necessarily have that same downside. Um, another pro of this thing is that it's it genuinely runs games good. Like, I, I, I don't know how else to put it. It's, as far as I can tell, perfectly accurate. Um, I'm sure some abstract hardware level, there are some, quite a few maybe, even inaccuracies, but if you're running regular games on the darn thing, it's, you know, if I were to black box this thing, um, let's say we take a Game Boy Advance and we take the analog pocket, we consoleize the Game Boy Advance, plug it into a television, and uh, give it a controller. We put the analog pocket into a dock, plug it into the same make model television, give it the exact same controller. And I were to put the same game on both and have you play them both, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be able to tell which one's running which. Um, unless there's like some quirk with that game. Whatever. You know what I mean. Uh, black box test, it would pass 100%, I think. Um, obviously, aside from the extra stuff like, oh yeah, if you hit the on-screen display button, it'll pop up with an on-screen display that a Game Boy won't have. Yes, but for like actually playing games, 100%. I, I don't think there's a single problem. Um, and, you know, like I said, it already has those common mods standard. So I think for people looking for, looking for this, this is a fantastic buy. But anyway... Let's talk about what I actually like about this thing. Um, so the biggest thing, like the first thing I noticed when picking this thing up, besides the fact that it's a lot heavier than I expected, uh, is the screen. Now, this thing has a massive screen. Uh, and one of the best features of this screen is that it is exactly 10 times the resolution of the uh, original Game Boy Color and Game Boy since they're the same resolution. Which means when we run Game Boy Color and original Game Boy games on there, we have pixel perfect scaling. This screen looks really good. Uh, is the volume? Yeah. Bring up the brightness there. Um, this, this screen is really, really good. I haven't had a single problem with it. On that note, I guess let's walk through a few of the screen features. Uh, so I ran my usual array of backlight kit tests on this thing and it passed every single color or every single every single test uh, I didn't have a single problem with it uh, that I have noticed on other Game Boy screens uh, So I guess let's talk about uh, flickering So if you've watched any of my backlight kit videos, you've heard me make this speech hundreds of times Well, not hundreds of times, but at least dozens of times um Flickering. The original Game Boy had no way to give you a transparent sprite. So, how do I have a transparent sprite here, you might ask? Well, it uses a workaround of the, uh, it, it implements, it reworks a bug of the original screen into a feature. So, the pixel response time of the original screen, and, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, the, the screen that the console shipped with. The pixel response of those screens is so terrible that you can flicker an object on and off uh, 60 times a second, you know, one, one per every frame. Um, you can flicker on and off and you won't see any of that flickering. It'll just be perfectly still. Now, the analog pocket has a much better screen in it, which means when you get those flickering sprites, it actually shows up as flickering. But the analog pocket has a feature called go into systems Game Boy Color video frame blending I have it on now if we turn it off oops I should just hit the button you can see now it's flickering well I can see it in person I don't know how well it's gonna come out on video um, shutter speed plus the frame rate that I'm capturing at plus the rate that this is flickering at might make it look exactly the same uh, but anyway uh, if you can see that flickering you can see exactly why a 
quicker pixel response isn't necessarily a good thing. But I also want to point out uh, that this screen does not have a problem that some of the other screens do have. Uh, so I've pointed this out on other Game Boy kits, not necessarily the Game Boy Color ones in particular, but some of the Game Boy Advance ones have an image retention issue. So the problem in that case is if you leave a flickering object on the screen long enough, uh, it will sort of burn into the screen and the LCD will retain that image for up to five minutes depending on how long it was there and the quality of the screen itself. Analog Pocket doesn't do that. It doesn't have any of those image retention problems. And even if it did, you can pop in here, uh, go to Settings, System, Game Boy Color, Video, turn on Frame Blending, and then it's gone. It's perfectly fine. Um, Personally, I recommend leaving it off because it might introduce some weird artifacts in some action games, but if you find a screen in particular or a game in particular is, is bothering you, you know, one of those elements, pop into the menu, turn it on, Bob Gianti, or turn it off, I guess. Uh, and you can you can leave that setting, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna change even when you change the uh, screen modes. Um, so, you know, set it and forget it type thing. I think it's fantastic. I think it's really well done, and I'm quite frankly disappointed that none of the other backlight kits have managed to implement a feature like that. Um, I'm, I'm talking talking about you specifically, backlight kit makers with on-screen displays. You can implement that. You just haven't. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> it's this. The screen just looks fantastic. I I'm really digging it. Um, look at some of the other tiers. I don't remember what I wanted to look at. We can, we can look at color tests. You can see the black levels are really good on this thing. Uh, this, this screen, if I recall correctly, is actually out of a VR headset. Um, I think it was the Valve Index, uh, which, you know, each VR headset's going to have two of these, one per eye. Um, I don't know the pricing on these things, but I know they're not cheap. It's huge, it looks great, I'm digging it. Um, but th the point is, it's it's a very high quality display. I haven't had, I haven't noticed any problems with any of the viewing angles and because it's laminated, you get that nice high quality display. Oh, I, could, I could go on about this thing all day. This is like, this is done right. Uh, I wish, I would like to see this type of screen in other, consoles. Which, on that note, I guess let's go ahead and compare with the Game Boy Color. Just at a glance, you could see how much bigger this thing is, and this is using a big screen. So in this Game Boy Color here, because um, I, I, I'm sure this won't stand the test of time, but here we go. I have uh, Funny Playing's 2.6 inch laminated Q5 backlight kit, whoops, and you could see just how much bigger this thing is. In fact, Let's use magic of uh, measuring tools to determine exactly how big that is. So on the Game Boy Color, it is about 49.25, we'll call it millimeters wide. Do, 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 do. About 44 and a half millimeters tall and gives us a, a diagonal of 66.25 millimeters. Whereas if we take a look at the pocket here, what order did I do it in? I already forgot. Tall, it is 59 millimeters. Wide, it is 66 millimeters and diagonal it is what about 88.5 millimeters um, I'm rounding of course it was nice even numbers but you could see how much bigger this Jesus thing is and for those of you out there wanted to see me peel that I left that on specifically because I knew I was going to put calipers on the screen. Um, 
yeah, it's a, it's a big boy. I think that is by far the biggest pro with this thing. It just has an amazing screen. Um, that being said, there are some downsides, and let's talk about that next. Um, I, I already went through all these, but I might as well go through them for the camera. It's perfectly linear. Uh, it passes all of these tests. You'll have to you'll have to take my word on that. I can't really talk about them too much. It's it's done well. I don't want to dwell on it. Let's move on. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there for now. Let us talk about. I think this is the right cart. We'll find out. Let's go into the Game Boy Advance game and talk about why the screen has some uh, some issues. Now, you notice I booted into a Game Boy Advance game. This isn't exactly the best uh, game for showing this off, but you get the idea. Um, we can actually go into the screen patterns. That was the wrong one. Let's reset it. Go into the screen patterns here. And go back one, because I went too far. You can see that is the size of the screen. You see it is no longer significantly taller than the Game Boy Color, but in fact it is about the same height as a Game Boy Color. Uh, now I have actually measured this. Uh, the Game Boy Advance, where is it? Yeah, there it is. The Game Boy Advance screen size is about 44 millimeters tall, which is about what I measured the Game Boy Color at, uh, but it is still about the same width that 66 millimeters um, with the 79 millimeter diagonal. Now, if we were to come in here with a uh, Game Boy Advance, and put a Game Boy Advance game in it. That looks like a Game Boy Advance game. You might notice the screen looks about the same size, and it is about the same size. Um, you still have that humongous LCD, but because of how aspect ratios work, and how this is a... It's not a 43 aspect ratio screen, because it's not. I forget whatever aspect ratio it is. Uh, it's the same as a Game Boy Color. But Game Boy Advance is a 3 to 2 aspect ratio screen, and this screen itself is closer to 1 to 1, which means that you have to end up with these black bars across the top and the bottom if you want your game to look proper. Unfortunately, that means your screen is a lot smaller, and comparing this against the Game Boy Color was kind of cheap, but if we compare it now to a Game Boy Advance, you can see you can get a much smaller console with a screen that is basically the same size for Game Boy Advance games. That being said, you can still play Game Boy Advance games on it. It's just, it's not, it doesn't wow me as much as playing Game Boy and Game Boy Color screens. That being said, it is still fantastic. But, like I said, it, it's, it's weird. It's good, but weird. So... Let's let's move on. I, I really like the screen, and I wouldn't have spent 15 minutes just talking about it otherwise if I didn't. Um, but it could use some improvement. Unfortunately, there's basically nothing we can do about the Game Boy Advance side of things. That's just how aspect ratios work. If you want to mess with it, this is not the best game. Let's just pull up that main menu. Oh, you know what? Actually, let's get... Pokemon in here. Everyone likes Pokemon. I don't know if you're supposed to hot swap this thing. Um, it's always neat. It tells you that the uh, cartridge pins are dirty if it doesn't read your game properly. Trust me, it's not the cartridge pins. It's the game itself. But usually, just pop it out, reseed it. You'd have that exact same problem in a Game Boy. Boom. Um, that is the unfortunate downside of using old hardware, and these games are certainly old. I also use them to test just better. Anyway, moving on. Um, if you hate those black bars, you can do something about it. It's a crime, yes, but you can still do something about it. A 
and now you've got full screen GPA. I mean, it looks horrifying, I think, but I don't know. Depending on the game you're playing, maybe it's fine. I really don't like it here, but... Oh, the worst part is the battle interface doesn't even look bad. Like, it's, it's stretched, and I can see that, but it's not that stretched. But, like I said, it's crime, which leads me to um, one of the bugs I found and could use improvement. If you swap screen modes, it just throws out all of your sizing settings, even if you go back to the original screen mode. It's kind of a disappointment. Also, if you have it on any of the other screen modes, like uh, the original Game Boy LCD or AGS 101 LCD settings, you can't... You can configure the size and position, but you can't configure some of the other settings. Or, oh, what do you know? You can. That must have been something that I missed in the update. Oh, there we go. That's it. You can't configure the size and position settings. That's what it was. Okay, I had it backwards. So, you can't commit that same crime if you want the uh, pixel grid mode and the uh, reduced color accuracy. But, I don't know. It is what it is. Um, it's not really a problem, I think, because if you're playing in that mode, you must hate yourself anyway. Uh, but it is persistent as long as you don't swap screen modes. So we can put that back if we want. And then every single time I start a Game Boy Advance game, It'll stick. And restart that. Cha da. Anyway, it's alright. I like it. But it's in Game Boy Advance mode, that, that screen to body ratio just really screws with it and it doesn't look great. I think that's why when most people are showing this thing off, they show it in a Game Boy or a Game Boy Color game because it just genuinely does look better. Um, that the screen actually fills the, the, the image actually fills the whole screen, um, which makes the screen to body ratio of this device look appropriate when you just have that, uh, you know, normal height Game Boy Advance, the screen to body ratio looks really off. It looks way too small. It looks like the bezels are just entirely too thick. Come on, stop that. You see how much black you have on top, on bottom, and left and right. It just, it it doesn't look right. I'm sorry, it is what it is, and it's... I mean, we deal with the exact same thing running uh, Game Boy Color games on a Game Boy Advance. It's just in the other direction. We have those big black bars on the side, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. You can stretch the screen, yes, but it looks horrifying. Um... It's the exact same problem, and there just is no workaround if you want it compatible with both generations of game. That's just, it is what it is. Game Boy Advance obviously prioritized Game Boy Advance games. Analog Pocket obviously prioritized Game Boy Color games. But both work great. Just one looks better. Uh, anyway. Uh, oh, I suppose let us uh, finish off the Game Boy, the, the screen discussion rather, with one more thing to point out here. Uh, so this is not using integer scaling. Now, I have already taken pictures. I'll upload them to an imager album and link them in the description if you want to look at it close up. This is an integer scaling. So one of the things that I praise about these screens in particular is how darn good the integer scaling looks. And now this is a horrible example because my phone won't focus on the screen. Uh, but you get these nice, solid, sharp, pixels, you don't have that screen door effect muddling the contrast and brightness, and you get the same effect here, even though it's not using integer scaling. So what it is doing, it is doing approximately a 6.6 .6 times scale, but what I believe the system is doing to achieve this nice sharp uh, effect is it's doing a 7 times scale instead, and then scaling it down, uh, it's doing a 7 times integer scale and then bringing it back down to where we need to actually fit it on the screen with um, like a, a bilinear processing. And 
it works. This screen is just so stupidly high resolution that a 6.6 .6 times scale looks great. Not a single problem. Um, it's, it's one of those technical things that once you notice it, it's kind of hard to unnotice, but you have to really look closely to notice it here. Uh, if we wanted to, we can actually bring down, if you wanted to see what a one time scale looks like. Oh, no, it looks like we can only do two times. That's okay. These two screens are running at the exact same resolution right now. This is a Game Boy Advance is, what is it, 240 by 160 or something like that. Double that, you get 480 by 320. This screen is a 480 by 320 screen. This is a 1600 by 1440 screen. Uh, but if we bring it down to two times scaling, that's what you get. So if you want to make the smallest Game Boy possible, you know, it's hella sharp. I'll give you that, but it ain't great. And then of course we can just swap the screen modes to bring it back out of that. Uh, so. Let's move on. I think that's enough about the screen. I think you guys get the point. Game Boy Color, it's phenomenal. 10 out of 10, not a single problem. Game Boy Advance, it doesn't look as good. It doesn't look bad. It just doesn't look as good. Um, it actually it actually kind of brings me off on a, on a tangent here. Same reason Apple puts the charge port of their mouse on the bottom, because they don't want people showing it off with a cord. So they put it in a stupid place that no one's going to possibly show off except people criticizing it. Um, so every time you see someone showing it off, you know, saying, hey, this looks good, you see it wirelessly because there's no way to plug it in otherwise. I think it's kind of a similar thing here. People are only showing it off with Game Boy Color and Game Boy screen games because it just looks better than Game Boy Advance screens, um, images, games. But whatever, that's, that's a discussion for another time, I guess. Um, Another thing I liked, the buttons. Let's discuss the buttons, because I have been rambling so long. Uh, I am going to bring up quit game. the AGS Aging ROM, because I think the key input test is going to be pretty neat. So, obviously, D-pad is fine. You, don't, you can't do opposing inputs. Uh, it has a nice pivot in the center there. It feels really good. I think they did a good job. Um, D-pad's great. Zero problems. T start select. Both feel good. Not a problem there. There is this analog button in between start and select. And, you know, at first I was thinking, oh, that's going to be a problem. But it actually feels pretty natural after using it. It's pretty obviously not start and select when you're feeling it. That texture does actually do wonders for the um, differentiating the two or the three. I have, in my time playing this, which realistically is only a few hours, I haven't had one single false input where I've hit the analog button instead of start or select or vice versa. Every time I hit a button, it's always the button I mean to hit. That is not necessarily true about volume and power, but the analog button is fine. Um, a and B, perfect, not a single problem. X and Y are a bit of a weird choice, but at least you can remap them to the shoulder buttons for Game Boy Advance. So maybe it'll make a little bit more sense for some arcade titles, but as a primarily Game Boy emulator, it's weird that they went with four face buttons, but we can speculate on that later. Shoulder buttons work as well. You've got them on the back. It's SP style, but SP is on, a, is on an axle so that it, it kind of swings a little bit. Whereas these are just, you know, straight up and down. They only really feel proper if you're hitting it from the middle. If you hit it at an angle, it feels kind of, I don't know, kind of gross. It works, but it doesn't feel the best. It works best straight up and down. Um, they work. They're not great. They're nothing to write home about, but they're perfectly usable. I haven't had any problems with them. In fact, my biggest concern actually is the fact that the cart is right next to the buttons and the cart just kind of, you know, sticks out. There's very little enclosure to it, but we'll circle back to that, I promise. I keep saying we'll circle back to things and, you know, we'll, we'll get there eventually. There's a, there's a method to this madness. Um, 
you can also, in Game Boy mode, uh, if you're booting a Game Boy or Game Boy Color game, you can turn on, I think it is like Super Game Boy mode, uh, and that lets you map the X button to B and the B button to A. And then I believe these are Turbo B and A. It's all right. It feels weird. Um, I actually had a problem when I updated this thing. I didn't know it had done that. Uh, what is this? That's not what we want. Let's get my Pokemon game, I guess. Pokemon Silver. Go into the game there. And then if we pull up the OSD Setem System GBC controls, we can turn on Super GB mode, which in the menu B is still B, but B turns into A in the game because X is now B. And it's it's probably better for some games, like if you're playing a platformer, um, Mario specifically, I know commonly people hold B and then hit A to jump, you know, so you're always running and then you jump nicely. And it's it's easy because you can just kind of rock your thumb back and forth, whereas if you're doing it like this, you're rocking your thumb in a completely different direction. So... It's convenient. It's not for me, but it is there. Um, my specific problem with it was after updating the firmware, it switched on automatically, and I thought my analog was broken. <laughs> um, it it was very jarring. Uh, but anyway, it's fine. Um, it's actually a pretty neat feature. I dig it. Uh, I'd like to see better... Um, controls for the controls, <laughs> uh, such that I'd like to be able to remap everything. Um, I don't know if this is something like you need to have a dock to unlock this, but like if I'm using an external controller, I might want to remap the buttons. It's less of a big deal for the internal controller, but for an external controller, I'd, I'd like to be able to have full control. But I guess, you know, I'm asking for a feature that I will probably never use because I don't even have a dock which means I'm not using external controllers because those connect to the dock, not the analog pocket. But anyway, moving on. Nice to have, but not necessarily a problem, especially when you consider the original Game Boy had no button remapping whatsoever, unless you got out a knife and started cutting traces. Um, anyway, I guess let us discuss the other two buttons. I kind of gloss over them, volume minus and volume plus and power. Uh, volume minus and volume plus are pretty close together. I often hit the wrong one. I'll mean to hit plus when I want minus, or minus when I want plus. That's nice. Uh, or both of them at the same time. If you hit both plus and minus at the same time, it toggles mute, and then you can disable mute by bringing up the volume or lowering it a little. Uh, but these buttons also, you know, if you're just rubbing your thumb up there, it feels the same as the power button, which if you hit that, the console, the console instantly goes to sleep, which most of the time, most games do seem to recover just fine. I haven't had a single problem yet, uh, but I have had some carts. I pop the cart in, try to put it to sleep, and it tells me it's not supported with this cart. Uh, I think it's pretty neat. I don't know specifically how it's doing that, but I dig it. I'm into it. Uh, I don't think it's a feature I'll use very much, because that's something we'll go into a little bit later, but... If you like it, you know, it does seem to work. Um, my concern is that jostling the cart will cause problems, but more on that later. Uh, let's talk about, let's move on. Let's talk about peripherals now. Uh, so like I mentioned, external controller support, you need the dock for that. Can't do much with the pocket. It would be really nice to be able to just do that straight with the pocket. Um, actually, I wonder, if we can just plug in a USB controller like this, I'll have to try that more uh, off screen. And if that doesn't work, I'll see about making a feature request or something. But um, I don't know, it might be interesting. Uh, peripherals, not necessarily controller, but headphone jack, it has one. I haven't really tested it. I don't care. It's a headphone jack. I'm sure it works fine. Uh, USB Type-C. Now, I didn't... Uh, 
Didn't really go over this, didn't test it too in depth, but if we plug it in with a USB-C host, you notice it does charge just fine. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that back into my phone. Uh, so it does work with USB-C hosts. It also works with USB type A hosts. The problem I ran into specifically is that when charging with a USB type A host, it seems to charge very slowly. Uh, it wanted to charge with my type C host a lot quicker. Uh, so for context, if I plug it into a USB A host, which is you know, like a USB 2.0 connection on your computer or something. It's only charging at 500 milliamps, which is probably by design because that is the USB-A standard um, for USB 2.0 at least. Um, whereas the USB-C host let me put 1.3 amps into this thing. So it charged over twice as quick with the USB-C host. Um, either way, not a complaint. Just thought it was kind of weird that it was different like that. It's Probably, you know, now that I'm talking about it, it sounds kind of intentional, so not too concerned, but it, worth mentioning, I guess. Um, link port. It does exactly what you'd expect a link port does. Uh, it does support multi-boot, which means we can plug in any accessory that the Game Boy might boot off of, like, for example, a um, wireless adapter here. Let me grab one of these bad boys. Uh, if we were to plug this into... We got a Game Boy Advance here with no game. Plug that in, boot up the Game Boy, it'll boot off that adapter so you can play multiplayer wireless games. This supports that, but with one caveat. The Game Boy Advance has these accessory port cutouts so you can actually, you know, plug this sort of stuff in. Uh, the wireless adapter specifically and the GameCube link cable are expecting those accessory port cutouts, which the analog pocket does not have, which means this can't be plugged in. Um, it'd look weird if you could, but that doesn't support that because there is not a hole where there needs to be a hole. It is an unfortunate oversight, and I actually criticized Zypher's slab design for the exact same problem. Um, there's a redesign of this thing now, but besides the point, I even criticized that Revo K101, same problem, it's less of an issue here because you wouldn't be able to use your R button, or I guess not less of an issue, but, you know, creates other problems. Um, but if you were to pop this thing out of the shell and remove these clips or just plug in the bare motherboard, it does work. I have tested it. You can use the wireless adapter on the analog pocket. Uh, I also tested out Link Cable. It works exactly like you'd expect. You need a Game Boy Advance Link Cable for Game Boy Advance games, or a Game Boy Color Link Cable for Game Boy Color games, because there are two separate Link Cable designs. Four if you count the connectors. But, uh, yeah, screw it. Let's go into it. Why not? So, we can think of Link Cables in a couple different ways. The easiest way I'm going to talk about is Generation 1, and Generation 2 link cables. A Generation 1 link cable is for the original Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Pocket, and Game Boy Light. It has one of these two connectors on it, the original Game Boy connector, or the Game Boy Color connector. This only works for Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, but it does work on a Game Boy Advance if you're playing a Game Boy Color game on the Game Boy Advance. This will work on the Pocket for Game Boy Color games only with the Game Boy Color connector. The DMG connector won't work, it won't fit, it's a physically different connector, it's a lot bigger. These things are protocol compatible, they just have different connectors. The second generation cable works only with Game Boy Advances. You'll notice it by, uh, you know, the standard two-player cable, which they updated that so you can have up to four players, I think. Standard two-player cable has a thicker side and a thinner side. Uh, I forget which is which, but one of them designates player one and the other player two. You can tell uh, Game Boy Advance cable by this extra notch on there and the octagon shaped connector whereas the Game Boy Color one a little bit different. Uh, granted there are probably some aftermarket Game Boy Advance cables that are using the wrong connector but this one is almost two decades old so of course it's using the correct connector. And then there are Game Boy Micro cables which are the exact same as the Game Boy Advance connector or cable but with Game Boy Micro connectors on it. Um, 
So yeah, two gen generations of cable. You'd need both of them if you want to link up both styles of game. Uh, but you only ever use one at a time. So if you're only ever linking up GBA games, only get the GBA cable. Analog sells a cable that is compatible with both generations. Uh, how that works is there's just a physical switch in the middle of the cable that switches the mode of the cable. Uh, if you have the cable in the wrong mode, it won't work for the game you're trying to play. Um, because this is, from what I can tell, a very solid re-implementation. Uh, if you want to... Do, 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 quick game. If you want to actually boot something multi-boot, just pop your game out, hit play cartridge, and it'll default to Game Boy Advance multi-boot mode. You see, link mode right there. And uh, if I were to plug something in that we can boot off of, I would show you, but I can't fit that because of the clips. Anyway, it's weird, but it works. I mean, here I am sitting here criticizing the analog pocket for not being able to use wireless adapters when my slate has a very similar problem uh, and doesn't support wireless adapters either. So I guess my point is it's not really that big of a deal, but something to be aware of, I guess. Uh, moving on. Game compatibility. So, like I said, software-wise, every single game I've thrown at this thing, not a single problem. Hardware-wise, things get a little bit more complicated. If you are an e-reader fan, I'm sorry to say this, but you will not ever get this working on the analog pocket. The clearances just don't work. Um, not that it's worth using on an analog pocket, but... Anything like this that is an unusual shape cartridge, it's not going to work. It looks like Analog targeted a few standard hardware designs like the pinball carts and, you know, made sure those worked. You know, Game Boy Camera cart also works perfectly fine. Everything clears nicely. And uh, here you can see one of the original Game Boy screen modes, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, and yeah, Game Boy Camera works perfectly fine. We can take pictures with it. Everything works exactly as expected. Spin that around. Smile for the camera. Ta-da! It's a horrible picture, but you get the idea. It's fine. Um, but some of the other... Some of the other weird stuff. Let me just get my little box here. Uh, Game Shark does work. The original Game Shark, um, Game Boy Pocket one at least, does work. Stuff like the Code Breaker. It doesn't fit right, but I think that's just a tolerance issue on the connector. And if you jam it in, it'll work. But funny thing is. I don't remember if this cart actually works, but if it does, it'll work on the pocket. Well, it's switched off. Eh, eh, eh. Nah, I don't. I don't think this thing works. But it's not a. It's not a pocket incompatibility. I just don't think this thing works. I haven't been able to get a booting on Game Boys either. So, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, like Brain Boy, that'll... that'll go in there just fine. And this one, I believe, works. Let's find out. Or I thought it did. This one should work. Have we found our first incompatible game? Maybe it doesn't work with Pokemon Silver and I'm misremembering how this thing works. I think I'm just misremembering how it works. Interestingly, it booted Silver in Game Boy Col or Game Boy Classic mode. Even though it says GBC, that's bizarre. Interesting. We'll have to investigate that more later. Um Hardware compatibility, it's mostly fine. Uh, stuff like Yoshi Tilt and Tumble, or Yoshi's Universal Gravitation, as they call it. 
Uh, we'll play in regular Game Boy Advance mode because this is more similar to where the cart slot would be on that. I have no idea what level this is, but it doesn't matter. You can see the uh, tilt is working just fine exactly as we would anticipate. Because it's playing off the actual cart. Uh, we also have WarioWare Twisted. That works perfectly fine. Um, though it's worth keeping in mind that it does calibrate on startup, so you can't hold it weird. I don't know what it's saying there. I'll have to figure that out eventually, but that works fine too. And it has rumble. Rumble's working fine. Uh, which I guess leads me to this thing. I did make an adapter at one point so you could plug Game Boy cameras into the SP and have them oriented the correct way. If you have a cart that doesn't quite fit, uh, like the um, Game Boy Advance SP Game Shark, something like this would work. You'd of course have to cut out one of the corner notches so that it triggers Game Boy Advance mode properly. Let's just go ahead and power that off just in case. I want to accidentally fry this juiceless thing. I did test it earlier. It does work if you do this horrifying adapter chain, um, but I don't want to have to modify my adapter again. I just put it back together and it's kind of a pain in the butt, but you'll have to take my word for it. It does work even if it's exceedingly awkward to hold and, you know, makes me extremely paranoid about doing something like this and knocking the whole thing out, but it does work if that's what you're after. Let me set this junk aside, make more space, and talk about one of the problems that uh, I had. One of the problems that I had listed in my notes here. Let's bring that back up. Oops. You have to hold it for a solid two seconds, which is like a second longer than I am used to. A second longer than I would expect. Let's quit the game. Wait, I don't know why I did that. Let's start that game back up. So what we want to see... I'm going to hit continue. We're going to sleep it. And yeah, just like that. Screen shuts off. Everything's fine. Comes back, wakes, resumes exactly where it left off. Even the music's fine. Happy, handy. If we were to pull this cart out while it's running, the game's gonna crash, because it's running off the cart. That makes sense, that's how it works. Uh, if we quit the game and restart it, let's talk about one of my concerns here with the sleep mode. We're gonna continue that. I'm gonna put it to sleep, and uh, here's what I think is happening. What I think is happening is the game is taking the memory state of, or the console is taking the memory state of the game and then just storing that while it's off and it's in sleep mode. And the cart's not actually doing anything. The cart's not powered right now. Uh, so I should be able to just pull that out and do whatever the heck I want and then reseed it and then wake it from sleep. Let's see if that works. Or if it crashes the game. See, there you go. Okay. So that alleviates one of my fears, uh, but that still leaves the other problem of, um, you know, what if you sleep it and uh, yeah, accidentally jostle the cart around because this this isn't exactly the tightest of cart slots and there's like nothing holding the cart in except the cart edge connector down here. So let's, let's assume the cart, something happened with the cart. Let's see what happens when we resume it from sleep. Wake. And it's not even in the game anymore because it knows the cart's been removed. Okay, so let's try that a third time, but this time I'm going to make the cart askew. Put it to sleep. Poke it. Bring it back. Oh, didn't go into the game. Ah, let's try it one more time, but from the other side. The problem is I want to uh, 
I want to askew the cart enough that I'm sure it will have an issue. Even though you'd likely notice that before waking it from sleep. I want to see what happens. Ah, I guess if there's a problem, it just quits out of the game. So now you know it. Don't, don't rely on sleep, but it's there if you want to use it. Um, I personally wouldn't trust it. You know, I'm playing at the beginning of the day, sleep it, come back to it four hours later. I wouldn't trust it to still have my game there. It, I don't see time making a difference. Um, like, obviously, it's perfectly reliable in these few seconds that I'm messing around with it. But um, as long as I'm not pulling the card out. I don't see time as a factor in that reliability, but it's probably worth considering. Um, just the amount of opportunities for it getting jostled in that time, pretty high. So, uh, I don't know. I, it's fine, but I don't like it. Uh, specifically, the cart slot. I'm not talking about the sleep feature. Uh, I don't like this cart slot design. Um, one of my... I guess, peeves. One of, one of my things uh, growing up playing the Game Boy Color, I always held it like this, with my two index fingers like this, uh, and I was always paranoid that something would bump the cart and mess up my game. That's why I had my index fingers up there to guard it. I don't play the pocket the same way because of how much heavier it is. I gotta wrap my fingers around the back. Um, I'm, not that it matters that much, and even if I did this, I'd be covering up the speakers. Uh, but the point is, I, I don't know, it just seems like it's it's so exposed, so easy to bump, and if you do bump it, you know, the game crashes. I've... Oh, I didn't expect that. I guess because I removed and reinserted the cart. Um, I did not expect it to come back. Game Boy Advance, you have to power cycle. But I've I've had enough things bump carts in Game Boy Advance, and of course I'm not doing it now. I can probably wiggle this all day with no problems. Go figure. Oh, there it goes. I wiggled it enough, the game totally crashed. It's 100% locked up. Of course I can still do that, but I can't do any of that nonsense. I've, I've done that enough times that uh, seeing that worries me and feeling how loose it is still concerns me. If I were making a case for this thing, I would have something that goes over the cart slot. I don't know how you'd manage that and keep L and R compatibility, but it's something I would look into. Anyway, let's move on. I've been I've been getting stuck on stuff quite a bit. Um, yeah, that cart slot. I got some problems with it. I'm sure it's fine, but. Time will tell, you know, maybe wear and tear will make this even looser and even less reliable. Uh, it's fine. It's not, it's not bad. It's fine, but I don't like it. Um, anyway, moving on. I'm not sure I dig the, uh, the look of the screen lens. Like, look at how proud that thing is of the body. This is a glass lens and it is sticking out if you put this thing down on a table which you shouldn't do not in this orientation but if you do because you're a rebel you rebel you it's setting down on the glass it will scratch if you do stuff like that you know sand is always going to scratch your screen um if you don't have a screen protector or anything on there not that i recommend a screen protector i'm just saying uh but my specific concern is that this is a pretty sharp edge and it might chip and cause the uh, lens to break. Again, that's a concern. I don't know how realistic that's going to be, uh, but as an aesthetic decision, I don't agree with it. Uh, for my own design, I went with the screen actually slightly recessed instead of proud. I thought that made more sense. But, I don't know. It's, it's certainly a decision. Um... I still think X and Y is a bit of a weird choice, but that's a personal opinion. Maybe, maybe eventually we'll see a uh, jailbreak firmware for this thing, and you know maybe they'll put 
Super Nintendo compatibility on here. I think it'd be pretty good for that. Screen aspect ratio is nice. You've got the buttons for it. Literally the exact buttons you need. Um, it would work, but that's a, that's a speculation. Until then, you know, if you're just playing Game Boy games, there's very little point in having these two buttons. Don't do much. Uh, but then again, neither do the shoulder buttons in Game Boy games. Um, I don't like the texture of this thing. I'm sure you've seen in other reviews, but it just, it holds on to fingerprints and, yeah, there we go. And it just, it looks dirty all the time. I don't know what to do about that. That's just, that's just a function of the plastic texture. I think, I think they could have done better. Um, it certainly doesn't feel like a Game Boy. It feels like a very, very, very fine matte finish. Um, and it just, it picks up fingerprints. I don't know, maybe a skin or something can alleviate that. You can already see how bad the back looks just for me setting this thing down. I don't think it's going to wear down gracefully. I, and I don't think that there's a single thing you can do about that aside from putting like a vinyl skin on the thing, but I don't know. Um, next up, I don't, I don't like the shape of the console. It's not bad. I just, I don't like it. And again, I'm going to have to compare it to my slate. Uh, let me put it this way. If I could design the ideal Game Boy console, which in my opinion I did, it would be shaped differently. And I shaped the edges differently. This thing's kind of heavy in the hand and it's got these sharp corners and I haven't had any specific problems. Um, but it's not comfortable. It's not bad. I just think it could be better. There's, you might be noticing a trend. Um, I think the best way I can word it is the analog pocket has more hits than misses. The things that it hits, it absolutely nails. And the things that it misses are like so close to being good that it's easy to look past. And this is one of them. Uh, the shape of the console, it's weird. I don't, I don't like this, these sharp edges on the sides. I, I don't, I just don't. I mean, it's not uncomfortable, but it's not comfortable either. Um, and to add on to that, this is an extremely dense uh, design. I don't know if you guys have seen the PCB for this thing, um, but it is packed. Actually, let me pull it up. Here we go. So they actually posted images of this thing. Um, if you look at the PCB for the thing, literally the only free space is where they have the controls. That's it. It's just solid components across the entire thing. You have the two FPGAs and all the supporting components for them. It is massive. There is just a lot going on. Um, Game Boys are designed to be light, plastic, and resilient. This is not a Game Boy, and the design, it's, it's immediately obvious when you pick it up. The, um, the size to weight ratio, the density of the thing, it feels more like you're holding a stupidly large smartphone than it does a Game Boy. Now, a fully loaded Game Boy with nickel metal hydride batteries is heavier. There's no game in here. Let me get out the drug scale here. I mean the scale. And can we see the... no. I guess you'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, I'll pop the Game Boy on here, and it is approximately 348 grams. Uh, huh? 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 No. Okay. You'll have to take my word for it. Oh, well, 348 grams. You saw how big this thing is compared to the analog pocket. They're basically the same size. Uh, let me pop the game out. Yeah, confirm. And so, no game in there. This thing is 277 grams. Uh, it's also quite chunky. It's got a lot of gravity to her. Um, it is lighter, yes, but it, it feels heavier. It's weird. Uh, and just for comparison purposes, here is a slate with no game in it. At 149 grams, very, very lightweight. 
Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do this reflection thing with my screen, but it's, it's just not happening, is it? There we go. You can barely see it. But it's backwards because it's a reflection. Never mind. Um, you'll have to take my word for it. It's there. It's all right. But it's weird. Um, and I don't think that weight is doing it any favors with the uh, shape of the console. Um, another thing I don't like, the marketing. I hate the marketing. I started talking about this in the beginning of this video an hour and a half ago. Uh, but that no emulation thing, I think it's really stupid and I really wish analog would change. I don't like how they advertise their hardware because I don't think it is representative of what their hardware is. Uh, that being said, they are saying stuff like that because of the certain connotations that the word emulation has. They don't really apply here, but they have a point. The reason they say that is because they don't want you to associate it with bad emulation, which for the most part, I'm sure plenty of us are familiar with. Um, and the biggest issue I have with this thing is the availability. Now, I went over this very early on in the video, but notice page still says pre-order and the fulfillment date is 2023. They don't even give you, like, this isn't Q1, this is sometime next year. Because they're not telling you Q1, assume it's Q4, which is a year and a half, almost two years from now. It's April, it's not that close. That's anywhere, uh, what, six, 20 months from now? They give you a window that's anywhere from eight to 20 months. That's absurd to me. I think that is absolutely the biggest problem with this console. It's all right, but, oh wow. Never noticed how warm the screen gets because I've always had that plastic on it. Mm, yes, very nice. Um, that is, that, that's, that's my biggest problem with it. But, you know, if you can get past that, if you can get one of these things for MSRP or close enough once you consider tax and, and shipping and whatnot, yeah, I'd say it's absolutely worth it. Um, which, speaking of, I guess let's briefly discuss the scalper prices on this thing. Uh, as I'm sure you guys are aware, there are plenty of people who bought these things with the intent to resell. And thankfully, enough of them have shipped that it has almost destroyed the market. And scalpers are now only selling these things for like $300 instead of $800. And at $300, if you weren't giving money to a scalper, if you weren't giving money to a scalper, I'd say that's a pretty decent deal. Um, so if you absolutely cannot wait, fine, whatever. Knock yourself out. Uh, I don't think you should support that kind of behavior, but it is what it is. And, you know, realistically, that's only like 50 bucks more than you'd be paying if you bought it straight from Analog anyway. And, you know, 50 bucks, what, what is that, a rare game? That's not a whole lot in the context of things. Um, but that being said, availability does still suck, so let's talk about some of the other options. Now, I'm going to separate this off into a couple different categories here. The first one I want to talk about are other devices that you can get that play off of actual physical hardware carts. Now, obviously there's Game Boys. Um, if you want to play Game Boy games, the best device is probably still going to be a Game Boy. Granted, you're probably going to want to modify it, almost definitely, and that can get pricey. But there are other options. Uh, like I mentioned way earlier, and even in another video, uh, we have the Revo K101. This runs games off of actual carts. It's, it's pretty neat, uh, but it only runs Game Boy Advance games, and Game Boy Color through an emulator, uh, but the emulator kind of sucks. Um, but the emulation, I'm calling it emulation, and it really is emulation. The emulation sucks. The accuracy is not great. Uh, as you can see, it can't even make it through this self-test cartridge. You see it fails there, and then it totally locks up. If I were to take this same cartridge, throw it in the uh, boot it up, Oh, 
we'll let it run through its tests. And you can see, as far as the synthetic benchmark is concerned, this is not only a regular Game Boy, but it is a perfectly functional Game Boy. And it'll run through all of the tests. We've even got the audio if I turn the volume up. But I don't want to listen to that, so I'm going to turn it down. Um, and let's circle back to the Revo here. Um, is it on? There we go. Like I said, emulation sucks, and I even discovered this when I tested it. Literally the first game I tried is one of the known not working games. So if you were to boot this up and try playing it, uh, you might notice the sky is black. The sky is not supposed to be black. Granted, if that's the only problem, it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, but you might also notice that the screen is the wrong aspect ratio. Uh, oops. I mentioned this earlier, but Game Boys use, Game Boy Advances specifically use a 3 to 2 aspect ratio screen, whereas the Revo K101 uses a 4 to 3 aspect ratio screen, which unfortunately stretches the image. Uh, it's not all that bad, to be honest. I don't have a problem with how the Game Boy Advance games look on this thing. Ah, <gasps> by Yoshi. Oh well. Um, and yes, I am fully aware that you can change the aspect ratio. I know I didn't cover this in my video, because um, quite frankly, at the time I wasn't actually aware you could even do that. You just hit the brightness button, hit down arrow, and now we're in the correct aspect ratio and everything's hunky-dory. You can see how close it was to that aspect. I swear I'm good at this game when I'm not talking at the same time. Um, you, can, you can see how much closer the aspect ratio is. Oh, we can't even finish this level with Yoshi. Come on. Oops. Um, you can see how close the aspect ratio was. And honestly, I think it's fine as it was. Uh, but the graphical glitch is the biggest problem. And even though it's still stretching, it's not using integer scaling. This is kind of a weird screen in that it doesn't actually look bad because it doesn't have the regular sub-pixel arrangement doing something kind of unique. Uh, but you can also bring it down into pixel perfect mode. And it's a lot smaller, but it's there. All right? Y'all can stop correcting me on the video. I know it's there. It just... Not everything makes it into videos unless I take notes and actually read off those notes, but then my videos end up twice as long as they usually are. So anyway, moving on. It's an option. It's not a great option, but it is an option. I think it's neat from a uh, collection standpoint, but I wouldn't actually recommend one to get and to actually play games off of. Um, but, you know, it is running off the cart. You can tell that when you remove it and the game crashes. Um, it doesn't just stop, it totally crashes. You heard that noise it made. Um, it's all right, but I don't recommend it. I guess the one thing it does have going for it is uh, the hardware emulation is actually pretty decent compatibility. -wise. Oops, come on. Turning it on is weird. Uh, like if you boot it with that K card installed, which is literally just a micro SD adapter, you can boot into ROMs and the uh, actual game emulation is pretty much the same running off an SD card as it is running off an actual game cart. Uh, we've still got all the normal controls, uh, but oh, this is not the Mario game I thought it was. Um, but it still has the same emulation issue. So if I were running Super Mario World, you'd see that black sky. Uh, and there are other games with compatibility issues. I just don't know what they are offhand. And it doesn't really matter. It's not the point of this tangent. Uh, other option, we have the polar opposite of this thing, the GB Boy Color, which will do Game Boy Color and Game Boy games only, not Game Boy Advance. Um, similar issues there, the screen is the wrong aspect ratio, wrong resolution, it doesn't look right, but it is a relatively cheap device and it will run Game Boy Color games pretty darn good. I hear the compatibility on that thing is actually pretty solid. Um, that being said, I heard it's also a literal hardware clone, so that would explain the compatibility. Uh, next up, uh, for things like if you want to play off an actual cart, we have consoles that will still interface with your physical cart, but they aren't exactly running the game off the cart. Uh, so we have this hardly qualifies, but it is 
worth mentioning, we have the Epilog GB operator, which you pop a cart in there, well, plug it into your computer, pop a cart in there, and it'll, um, basically the software is set up that it'll dump the game to your computer's internal storage and then launch an emulator with that game. And like, it'll load up your save and everything. And then when you save in the emulator and quit the emulator, it'll write that save back to the game. So the effective end result is that you're playing off the cart, but the difference is the emulator that is built in kind of sucks and you can't configure any of the options because Epilogue gave you one software update since this thing is launched and they have totally abandoned ship. Um, I'd hazard a guess and say that this thing is actually a scam and that you shouldn't buy it based off the fact that most of the features that they promised still aren't implemented 10 months later. I don't remember when this thing launched. I thought it was uh, February 2021, but correct me if I'm wrong. If you have one, it's all right, but don't buy one. Um, on that same note, we have the Hyperkin Retron SQ, which works identically to this thing, except it's its own dedicated computer. You don't have to plug it into a computer. Um, the difference is it does not have save right back. So how it works is you plug your cart in and it'll dump the cart and then you can play that cart in the emulator. Sometimes it'll read the save, sometimes it won't, but it saves to the micro SD card. So when you quit that game, pull your cart out, your save is still untouched on this thing. So if you were at level one in Mario and you played through to level 10, saved and quit, your cart is still gonna be at level one, but if you put this back in your Hyperkin and boot it up, you'll be at level 10, which leads to one of the quirks. If you were to say, play a different game, fine. Maybe it'll dump that just fine and you can play that. But then if you go back to the first time, first game and you have a save on your cart, it will dump that save again and overwrite your original save. That was a problem that I experienced with mine. I granted there has been one firmware update since and that thing's been out for quite a while too. So I'd hazard a guess and say that that thing is basically a scam as well. Um, I haven't tested it on the new firmware, but if it behaves anywhere similarly, it's still horrible. Game Boy Color compatibility is a little bit better than Game Boy Advance, uh, but not much. Um, and that thing, the Hyperkin Retron SQ, it doesn't output the correct aspect ratio no matter what you do. It's just wrong. You have a, you have a, a hardware switch to switch it between four to three and 16 by nine. Neither of those are the aspect ratio that any Game Boy uses. So no matter what, it's still wrong. I've heard or I've read that the new firmware update fixes the Game Boy Advance aspect ratio. No idea how. I'd be interested in checking that out, but I'm probably not going to do a video on it because I don't expect that it's that much better that it's actually worthwhile looking into now. Um, and that about does it for cart compatibility. I know there are some original Game Boy clones out there uh, the names are escaping me right now, but they only play original Game Boy games, no Game Boy Color. There's no mods for them. They still have awful screens. They exist, but I mean, they're, they're basically collectibles at this point because they stopped making them 30 years ago, uh, probably closer to 20 years ago, but y you know what I mean? They're, they're old. They're not great, but they're technically an option, just not in the same category that I would consider the analog pocket. Um, that being said, if you're open to not playing your physical games, but playing, for example, off of a flash cart, just had that booted on the Game Boy Color here. Let's quit the game, swap that out. If you want to play off a flash cart, you might notice this flash cart is not quite compatible with the analog pocket. Now, I've read your mileage may vary. Uh, some are, it could be dependent on the specific firmware version I have and the specific SD card. Lord knows I do not have a name brand SD card in there, but still, if I quit this game and do literally nothing else, but plug it into an actual Game Boy, running actual Nintendo Silicon, look at that, it boots just fine. Funny how that works. Um, that being said, I did try this out with my EverDrive GBX7, and that does seem to work. I wouldn't rely on it. 
Um, also, on that same vein, flash carts for Game Boys are cart emulators. They are. You can you can sit here and argue all you want if you want, but Nintendo already has a precedent. Uh, their second party developer, Intelligent Systems, uh, made dev hardware for the original Game Boy called ISCGB Emulator. There are dashes between IS, CGB, and then emulators, two dashes. Um, and you know what that is? That is a cart emulator. And it says right on the thing, if you look at the options spec on the bottom, you can see cart emulator. And what it does is it plugs into your Game Boy and plugs into your computer, and then via the software on the computer, you can load any game you want on it. It emulates that cart. It has some extra dev features that made it useful for the specific purpose that it was made for, uh, like you know code breaks. So you, you can step through code. You can do palette editors, stuff like that. It is a cool tool, but it is a cart emulator. And like I said earlier, the Analog Pocket is a Game Boy emulator. When you're running two emulators into each other, you run into compatibility issues, as you saw with the Easy Flash that does not boot. Um, I did also try it with an Omega. Did work with the Omega after the update. I didn't try before the update. Um, and I did try it with an EverDrive. That also seemed to work. Um, I, I tried both Omegas, the original Omega and the Omega Definitive Edition. Um, both seemed to work, but that's not the point. I've read plenty of people saying that theirs does not work. Uh, that's that's kind of the thing. Um, to go off on yet another tangent, uh, the way that works is the Game Boy is a standard. Uh, this would be better with props. Let me get props. Here, this is good enough. All right, so the Game Boy is a standard. We will call that standard this circle. This is a Venn diagram, by the way, and this circle represents the Game Boy. Now, the analog pocket is designed with modern electronics, and those have a little bit tighter of a tolerances, um, but they were able to hit most of the same spec. That's this little circle inside. Um, I put it tangential to the edge because I'm sure there are some things that just barely don't work. I haven't found them, but I'm sure they exist. Well, the flash carts, like EverDrive and um, Easy Flash, are the same thing. But notice the overlap. Of course, this is obviously not drawn to scale. Um, and those with analog pockets and flash carts that fall into that overlap, you're going to be perfectly fine. But for everyone else here and here, you're going to have problems. It requires both an analog pocket on that side of the tolerances and both flash cart on that side of the tolerances for everything to work. There are workarounds that analog and um, the flash cart developers can implement to improve that compatibility, but the problem is it's it's on both of them, not, not analog specifically, not easy flash specifically, not crick specifically, but all of them. Um, and I wouldn't rely on any of them to fix it because, like I said, it's a cart emulator and a Game Boy emulator. Mixing the two is not always going to be the best result when you could always just da, 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 get something else entirely. Uh, so I thought this was on. Um, whoops, I must have turned it off. Uh, this is PlayStation Vita. This is a perfectly capable emulation device for stuff like Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. Now, tangent, again, because whatever, at this point, we're almost two hours in. Hardly anyone's going to still be watching. Um, the Vita is a pretty decent emulation device on paper, but the problem is that for the longest time, hardware acceleration was not unlocked for uh, homebrew users. Uh, however, the Vita can... Mm, I, I, I want to be careful with my terminology here. The Vita can load an application called Adrenaline, which is more or less an integrated PSP. Adrenaline has very, very solid compatibility, and 
can run pretty much anything a PSP can, which means that anything that runs on a PSP will also run perfectly fine on the Vita. Um, now, of course, we can also launch RetroArch, uh, Retro install that, play your games that way, running native Vita mode. Uh, but, whoops. Unfortunately, I don't think I have mine set up properly. Uh, I did try updating it for the video, and I think I broke something in the process because I just get a black screen and then a GPU has crashed. Yeah, there it goes. Oh, hey, it's actually working this time. It didn't work last time. So maybe I was doing something wrong. That is the wrong aspect ratio, but I can fix that. The emulation, it's perfectly fine. PS Vita, PSP, either way, you're not going to have a problem. Uh, I highly recommend a PS Vita over a PSP because PSP hardware is just pure garbage. Um, but I'd also only recommend either a PSP or a PS Vita for someone who might be interested in Sony games more so than Nintendo games because the compatibility with uh, PS Vita games on a PS Vita is darn near 100%, <laughs> which should be saying something. Now, um, every game made for the Vita runs on this thing, so... You can play Vita games, you can play PSP games, you can play PlayStation 1 games, all at... The Vita games obviously run better, and the other ones are emulation, but, you know, it, it's good. It's definitely a viable option. And the best part is, you can get one right now. They made probably millions of these things. Um, unless you're in Japan, they probably weren't very popular at all, but you can import a Japanese one and use it. Same way you'd use a US one. This is exactly what this thing is. This was made in Japan. I imported it. And uh, I don't know. It's been working fine for me. Uh, I thought it would say on the back there, but I guess it doesn't. Um, original PSPs had region codes. I guess they did away with that on the Vita. But that is why my accept button is circle and my home button or my back button is X. Uh, but anyway, import them. They're pretty good. Don't bother with PSPs. They kind of suck. But PS Vita is an excellent addition to that. Um, that being said, I'd be remiss not to mention it. In fact, it's even before the Vita in my notes. I got carried away. The Mister Project. Uh, the Mister is... I don't have one. I'd love to get one and play with, but I, I know I won't actually play with it, and it's kind of expensive, so I haven't, haven't really got into it. Whatever. Uh, the Mister and the analog pocket are fundamentally the same device except made by two completely different companies companies uh analog's a company the people who make the mister is not um made by two separate entities with two separate goals in mind but they're the fundamental fundamentally they are the same thing they both run uh an Altera FPGA to run cores to emulate games uh the difference is the mister is not a portable device and it does not run off real carts. It only runs off of um, ROMs. Uh, that being said, I've heard the performance on the thing is rock solid and one of the best experiences you can get as long as you don't mind playing on uh, your, your home TV with an external controller, uh, which is a little weird for Game Boy, I think, but if you're into it, you know, it's an option. It's pretty good. Um, I can't say much about it. Like I said, I don't have one, uh, but I've only heard good things. That being said, it's a little pricey, but I guess if you're considering an analog, um, if you're considering an analog pocket, a mister isn't really that out of reach, uh, especially since you can actually get them right now. I say that, but I think the DE10 Nano is currently out of stock just about everywhere, but there's only a two month wait list, not a 14 month wait list. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, other devices, of course, you have uh, Nintendo DS, 3DS. You can run, you can homebrew the 3DS or DSi and run ROMs off that. You can get a flash cart for the DS or DS Lite, run ROMs off that. They both work as long as you're, you know, if you're into playing ROMs, as long as you're okay with that. They're both great devices. Hell, you might already have one. Uh, on that note, smartphone. These things work great with emulators. Um, oh, I'm throwing stuff. Also, 
might as well bring up the Nintendo Switch. If you get a launch model, you can install an exploit on here that'll let you install custom firmware without having to go to mod chip. These things have a RetroArch port just fine. They run a lot of games, they're very good, and even if you have to buy a new one and a mod chip, it might still be cheaper than buying an analog pocket and a dock from a scalper. And you can actually get one right now, which I think is the important part. Uh, but those aren't really the, the devices I think that would be ideal for this sort of thing. I think that falls to these guys, uh, these Anbernix here that I have done videos on in the past. Um, I think I did a few videos on this one respectively, and then at least one on this one, but they might have been in the same video. And uh, apologies, I meant to do follow-ups on both of these after playing with them. Uh, but that didn't happen due to some really weird harassment I was getting. Um, anyway, I think that guy has um, buggered off, so I think we're safe to talk about him again. Um, if you don't mind not having physical cart compatibility, these are two of the best devices you can get for running emulated games. Uh, the actual emulation on the system, both of them, absolutely fantastic. If we look at the RG351P, which is actually a much more powerful system than the 350, um, it has the perfect screen for uh, Game Boy Advance games. So I'll fire up Advance Wars here, one of my one of my favorites. Oh, this is Advance Wars 2. Um, it's good. I dig it. I mean, look at that screen quality. You can turn off the FPS counter. I just had it on because of the other stuff I was testing with. It's good. The single biggest problem I have with these devices is that they come pre-configured with really, really crappy software and thousands of ROMs. Um, my, my biggest recommendation, no matter which one you get, 350, 351, uh, Kitty, whatever, any of these sort of devices, First thing you do, you take the micro SD card out of it and you just set it aside. Do nothing. Don't don't bother. Don't mess with it. Don't upgrade it. Don't reload ROMs. Do nothing. Get a new SD card that is actually quality on this device, the 351, the actual software that, you know, the OS for this thing lives on the SD card. So if you replace the SD card, you have to replace the software. Just get a new SD card, an actual name brand that you don't have to be concerned with crashing. Um, and run that and you'll be in a much, much better situation. Um, I, for the 351 in particular, I like this Amber Elect software, uh, which 351 Elect or something. Uh, I'll, I'll link it in the description. Uh, there's a YouTube channel that covers these things way better than I ever could. Uh, and they have plenty of guides on setting them up. Highly recommend getting third-party software that's pre-configured because otherwise you're sitting there setting up the emulators for every single system you want to play. It's not fun. Uh, the learning curve on it, I think, is awful. Uh, but if you reload it with some third-party software uh, that already comes pre-configured, like this Amber Alec OS that I was just mentioning, the experience is significantly improved. And then you can load it up with only the games you actually want to play. Choice paralysis is a real thing. If you put every single ROM on this thing every time you fire it up, if you don't have a specific game in mind, you're going to sit there for 20 minutes scrolling through your ROMs before you decide, oh, I'm just going to play the exact same game that I've always played. And it's it's not it's not healthy. You, know, you, you ever fire up Netflix and you just sit there... Oops, I did the thing. I did the Super Nintendo thing. This is a Game Boy Advance game. I can remap the buttons. I just didn't. Um, yeah, they absolutely fantastic for emulators. Uh, the 351P in particular, like I said, the screen is just perfect for Game Boy Advance. You can't get a better screen uh, for Game Boy Advance. It's literally compared to these two. Let me, let me throw Pokemon in here, or not Pokemon, Super Mario.
and you can just compare the two screens. I suppose it doesn't matter that it's on the same specific level, but like I said, this is a very good screen. It's just less good in Game Boy Advance. And even if you want a big screen, Amber Nick is bigger in Game Boy Advance games. It just is. It's quite a bit bigger. This is a three and a half inch screen. Um, I don't remember what I measured this one to, and I'm not gonna measure this because I don't want to scratch the screen with my calipers, but I, I genuinely haven't had a single problem with it, and I would turn to this thing if I could only ever have one device for playing games, I think I think I'd turn to something like this. Granted, my hobby isn't necessarily playing the games as it is tinkering with the hardware itself, so that's not happening, but like even with an operating system running behind this, I'm not having a single problem with input lag, um, latency controls, everything's, everything's fine. The controls are great, the actual hardware feels very solid. Um, like I said, literally my only problem with it was that the software that it comes with is garbage and you want to get rid of it. Uh, the back end is of course RetroArch, so you're running whatever cores are on that. Uh, but the cool thing is, is this is running um, a modern version of Linux in the background. It's literally running Ubuntu. Uh, you could just throw a Wi-Fi dongle on here and then update the cores. Like, so you always have the latest updates on this thing. Uh, I don't know, this is using a special pre-compiled version with certain tweaks enabled, but if you want to go your own route, that's certainly an option. Um, it works. Uh, there's also save state support, because RetroArch. Um, you ought to forgive me, I don't know how this thing works that well. But look at that. Save state. Ta-da! And then I can just quit that and go into something else. And it's, it's great. I really dig it. Um, like I said, this is the more powerful console, but I still have it preferred for Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color just because of the screen resolution, but it'll run PlayStation games perfectly fine. Every single game that I have tried has run at 100% speed with no hitching, stuttering, or weird skips or anything like that. And please don't take this to mean I'm saying every single game will run perfectly fine. I'm just saying every single game I tried, which, as you can see, consists of two games on this console. It wasn't a lot. Um, I have played way more PlayStation on this one than I have on this one, but if it runs great on here, it'll run even better on this one. Uh, but that being said, let's talk about the other one because I think that is a um, worthwhile mention as well. This is the older device, the Ambernick RG350, uh, which is based off of an Ingenic SoC. Uh, this one has a Rock Chip SoC, which if it had a little bit more uh, RAM, it could just run a version of Android if you wanted to, and then you'd have that whole App Store ecosystem open to you. Uh, but this is a uh, much older based chipset, uh, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because this thing has been around so long, the software has gotten extremely polished. Now, granted, the uh, software that Ambernick ships it with is garbage, but as long as you update it, I recently installed, I think they're calling it the Atom image. Um, again, linked in the uh, description there for more info. It runs games fantastic. Uh, this one has a four to three aspect ratio screen, and I did actually update it from the original 320 by 240 to 640 by 480, and highly, highly recommend that update for this version of the device. This is the RG350, uh, not the 350P, not the 350M, just 350. Um, I like this one in particular because I like playing PlayStation games on it, and I like the uh, joystick setup. For SNES, it's a little bit less ideal. You might like the 350M, uh, but this is a 350M screen in a regular 350. If you install that screen in your 350, um, 
you have to use 350M firmware, but oops, I missed that. I haven't played Aladdin in forever and I can hardly play even if I'm not talking. Um, it's good. I dig it. Super Nintendo is absolutely not a problem with this thing, uh, but I primarily use it for uh, PlayStation games. Haven't had a shingle problem. Um, I showed off earlier, it runs Bloody Roar just fine. Ever since I installed the Atom image, PlayStation software, I've noticed, does have a few hitches here and there, but it's not game-breaking. And to be honest, I don't know if it's something I can configure in the settings or I, I, I don't know what it is. I, I haven't messed with it, but it still plays more than good enough for me. And it still had my saves after updating, which is something I forgot to consider. Oh, I should use save states more often. I don't I wonder if I have a save state for this game. Ha, I do. But that's not current. Oh, we can load. Oh, wait. Now my save is gone. That's bizarre. I must have swapped out the memory card, the internal memory card. Um, uh, the. This thing. In the core settings. I don't know which memory card I was using, but it clearly wasn't one. Um, oh well, probably not gonna play this game on here anymore. Mm. It works, it's fine, it's good for what it is. Uh, unfortunately, the screen aspect ratio and resolution make it kinda not so great for Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color. The organization is kinda weird. But emulation-wise, it's still perfectly viable option. Just highly recommend the screen upgrade. And I didn't dig the um, analog sticks that it printed or that it shipped with, so I got my own. I don't know what the heck this is. That is not what I thought it was. Oh my god, is that one of those? I don't know where I got this from. I own the game, I would have normally ripped it. Jesus. Anyway, obviously the emulation is fine. Um, it's not using integer scaling, and if you do, the image looks kind of not great. Uh, but it is using RetroArch um, with a different skin here. Settings, video, scaling. There we go. So we have integer scaling off. But if you turn it on, look at how much smaller the image gets. This rev resolution just isn't good for Game Boy Advance. But it works. Um, Game Boy Color and such do seem to run quite a bit better. Um, that's because this aspect ratio is a little bit closer to... Uh, what you'd expect on an original Game Boy or Game Boy Color. But for Game Boy Advance specifically, this one is still the bee's knees. Everything else, I think this one does it a little bit better, but you still have to do those upgrades. I think it's a lot better with those uh, printed joysticks that I got. The other ones, they stick out so much. It makes this thing so not pocketable. Uh, and I don't like the 350M, because like I said, I like PlayStation games. And a lot of them I play with the sticks, so that's just a little bit better. Uh, but for non-PlayStation things... Good lord, that's loud. I suppose the 350M might be a little bit better, but yeah, the screen isn't running at the correct aspect ratio, and that's not the default, or that is the default with this software. Uh, but it's easy enough to fix. Settings, video, scaling, integer. Oh wait, no. We'll just keep aspect ratio. That's better. And that looks fine. We got black bars along the sides, but between these two, this one looks better for Game Boy games, I think. 
Let's just fire up the same thing, why don't we? Uh, oh. Just wondering if I had crystal clear on here. You see it runs by default in this emulator with a uh, overlay. That's also not crystal clear, that looks like regular crystal, but you can see how much bigger the screen is on this one as a result. So, aside from Game Boy Advance, it's rough. Like, there's there's no compromise. That goes back to the screen thing I was talking about with the analog pocket. There's just, once you mix and match all these weird aspect ratios, you have to compromise somewhere. Um, I need to quit both of these. They're making too much noise. But yeah, there, there aren't, there are neat devices out there as long as you're willing to compromise. Um, so that kind of sums up the notes I had uh, <laughs> two hours later. Jeez, Louis. Um, all that to say, this is a good device, but only for certain use cases. Um, I don't think if you're playing, if you're primarily playing your games off of a flash cart, this is not the device for you. I mean, granted, don't let someone who bought two Visteons tell you what is a bad purchase, because um, obviously that person has no idea what a bad purchase looks like if they bought two Visteons. But what I'm saying is there are better purchases if you're going to emulate your hardware anyway. It is what it is. You can still buy one of these things and you can still play with it and have fun. It's just... It's not the optimal experience for using one of these. It is pretty damn good with one of these, which is to say this is a single ROM cart. So if you wanted to build like one of these, you know, custom flash cart that has one game on it, it'll work like a hot damn with one of these. Same way a Game Boy would for the most part. Eh, eh, slightly out of frame, but these are fine, yeah, sure. Uh, but if you want to play off one of these, there are better better ways to play your games. Um, that being said, it also is hella neat from a collection standpoint, which is primarily why I wanted one. I think, you know, as someone who owns basically every other Game Boy, this would fit in neatly. And it does play well, but there are enough little things about it that um, since I literally designed my own <laughs> Game Boy, I'm probably going to stick with that. But, you know, if, if all the things I mentioned, you know, if they don't bother you or, you know, you just really want one of these things anyway, it is genuinely a good buy if you can find one for MSRP. but only if you actually use it correctly. There, are, I see a lot of people like going crazy about how you can convert the games because this thing supports uh, GB Studio games. You can just load them up on the SD card and boot them that way. There's, by the way, the only point of the SD card is updating firmware. Um, if you, once you update the firmware, you don't need that anymore. Um, but you can load up GB Studio ROMs, and I've seen people who went out of their way to patch normal games like Pokemon Crystal into like that GB Studio package and then load it on the analog pocket that way. But like what what's the point of that? You're you're buying this thing that they went out of their way to make compatible with original hardware, and then you're just running it off of an SD card? Like that's that's not how it works. If you're, you know, if you're sitting there saying, "Oh yeah, but it's like real hardware," no, it's still, it's still emulation, my friend. It's, you can get the exact same experience, maybe even better, with something like this. And let's, uh, I want to show you something pretty neat here. If we shut this thing down, I can show you um, that it actually has. 
an SD card as well that you can put games on. And you don't have to convert them to some weird pocket format. You can just load the ROM as is. And it works great. Um, but if you're... I don't know. It, <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, but as long as you're actually playing off of, like, physical carts... Yeah, this thing's fantastic. I'm digging it. Um, I don't really have much else to say about it. It's a good-looking bit of kit. You get a lot of console for your money. And it does exactly what it says it does. Um, the only other thing I had on my list was I was going to do a full teardown of this device, but at this point we're, we're what, 135 minutes in? I don't think it's... I think I'll save that for another video, but... I don't know. I, that, that, that's all I got to say. Uh, I'd like to be able to check out some of the accessories for this thing eventually. I think it could be could be pretty neat to um, check out the Game Gear compatibility uh, settings. It's supposed to be also compatible with those other systems I mentioned, but you might notice they're not in the menu yet. And since the dongle adapter thingies aren't available, I'm guessing it's not quite implemented yet. But, I don't know. It's there. It's, it's I. I'm eager to check them out. Maybe I'll see if I can make my own adapters and do it that way. But yeah, that's, that's all I got. It's, it's big, and I dig it. Um, might as well shut it down if we're done using it. That's all I got, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, anything in specific you want me to check out, please let me know. Um, I did an Instagram post about this specifically with these two devices, you know, asking if there was anything you wanted me to show off that uh, maybe other reviewers didn't do. I didn't quite get the following or the response that I was expecting, so I made this video instead of the live stream that I was planning. Uh, but one thing someone did mention was they wanted to see the fit and finish of the device. Um, I kind of already went over like the plastic quality. I, it, it's fine. There's zero flex to this thing. It is stupid solid. Um, like I said, it feels dense. I don't like the texture. Um, but the tolerances are good on all the buttons. The D-pad is kind of loose in there. Like you can get it all loosey goosey and spin it around. Uh, well, not like any meaningful amount. It's fine. Uh, you need loose tolerances on a D-pad, otherwise it binds and it doesn't feel very good. Um, tolerances on it feel great, to be honest. Uh, they, But this particular user had mentioned they'd seen panel gaps on some of the other ones. I don't see any such problems on mine. The screen is perfectly... Uh, I don't want to say flush because it's definitely very proud, but that's an intentional design decision and it is even all the way around. There are no gaps on the screen. The front panel of the housing, uh, perfectly flat as far as I can tell. No weird gaps anywhere. The back panel of the housing meets up with the front panel nicely. It's hidden in this uh, step over here, uh, but there isn't any gap that I can see or that I can feel with my finger on any of the sides. Um, realistically, if I was looking for problems, the only one that I can find is that the tolerances around the cart port aren't anywhere as near nice as the tolerances around the rest of the device. But literally everything else is, um, it's very tight, very, very well done. I think I'm good with it. Uh, fun fact while we're back here, Analog had a custom cart slot made for this thing. I thought they would have used those off-the-shelf uh, like Game Boy Advance SP ones like I have here, but not anymore because I moved them apparently. Um, but no, they actually... Oh god, there's something in there. I already, I already got something in here. This was one of my concerns with how short this thing is. Something might fall in there. And something has indeed fallen. Um, 
Though, to be fair, that could have fallen in any of my Game Boys. At least because it was so short, I was able to fish it out. Um, but no, they, they made these uh, custom cart slots. And I don't know how well you can see that. I'm trying to get the light just right and the angle. No, no, that's not going to work, is it? If you look inside there to the left in the back, you can see that little analog logo on the cart itself, or on the cart slot. Uh, no, it's not, it's not working out. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, maybe when I do the uh, teardown on this thing, I can show that a little bit closer. But till then, uh, I don't think it's going to wear very well. But the actual fit and finish of it is finely. Like, look at that! Look at those fingerprints, man. Like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying. I mean, I know you guys rag on me a lot for doing this sort of stuff with screens and getting my fingers all over them, but. <laughs> And clean that up. It cleans up nicely. But it picks up fingerprints just so quickly, man. Um, but yeah, fit and finish is pretty decent. You, you can see all this stuff that it's picking up just from me setting it down. But to be fair, I am setting it down on this silicone mat where there's flux and stuff. And I should have cleaned it. And that's mostly what this is but I don't know I like it I'm really glad I got one um and I definitely recommend one if you can get one at MSRP but don't pay the scalper tax all right that's all I got this time I promise I'm done um at least for this video catch you all next time thanks for watching check the description for handy links uh, other videos I referenced um these things in particular and by the way, for full context, no one paid me to make this video. Every single device you see here, I have purchased with my own money, including these stuff. The only exceptions are these two. Uh, these were both provided by, God, I think it was Banggood or Gearbest. Uh, I hope they're not watching. They'll feel real bad about that. Uh, they provided me these two to make videos on, and I did make videos on them, and I genuinely did like them. But this is a video on the analog pocket. I bought this out of pocket. I bought this pocket out of pocket. Um, I really dig it. And this, I, I said a while back that I'd be borrowing somewhat, someone's pocket to do a video on. Uh, that fell through, but I did actually buy one, and this one is mine, so we can do whatever the heck we want with it. Um, that is, that, yeah, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Get you all next time. I was just cleaning up and I found two things on my desk that I forgot to talk about during the video. And I just, just real quick, promise, not gonna, not gonna be a long tangent. I just want to discuss them because I don't think any other YouTuber slash reviewer would have tested this particular thing. Uh, but if we power this bad boy up... I have here, oh, come on, I have here the Play Yan Micro, which is an official thing from Nintendo. It takes an SD card, and I have in there a 512 megabyte SD, or micro SD card, because this thing only works with one gig or smaller cards, um, but it plugs into regular Game Boy Advance, or Game Boy Advance SP, or Game Boy Micro, or DS, whatever, um, and it boots up and it lets you play uh, like mp3s or video files or anything like that. Physically it does not fit in the analog. Uh, unfortunately the uh, shell design does get in the way of that but I did test it with that adapter I showed off earlier and it does work. I was able to play this goofy ass video there. It's fine. It works. It's great. Uh, but anyway, there's also a, another cart here that's very similar. Uh, this is the AM3 player, I guess. Um, both of these carts were made in Japan. I think this one is a Japanese exclusive. This one did make it out of... The play -in did make it out of Japan, just under a different name. Um, but this takes smart cards, like this, this particular one is uh, Shin-chan, 
but pop that in there. And this one doesn't have any weird shaped gotchas. Uh, it does actually just fit right in. It is a Game Boy Advance cart, even though it's halfway between a Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color game. That's the worst example I could have grabbed. Um, here we go, another slate. Cha-da. Jam that in there. This works perfectly fine on the analog pocket, which is notable because uh, with consolized Game Boy Advance hardware, uh, specifically with uh, ZW Energy's GBA HD, um, that specific mod messes with the clock rate of the Game Boy Advance enough that it doesn't actually work on consolized Game Boy Advances. But it works perfectly fine on the analog pocket here, and presumably uh, the same thing should work in, uh, in the dock, but I don't have it to test. But as you can see, works perfectly fine. Uh, it's not the best viewing experience, but it works. I mean, I, I've never watched this because what I hope are obvious reasons, but I thought the cart was neat enough that I grabbed it, and it does work, which I think is particular. Oh, you know what? Let's try sleep on it. That'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, this cart doesn't work on um, modified Game Boy Advance that overclock. Uh, actually, we can try it out on this in just a second. I just want to see if sleep works. I didn't even think to test that. Come on. Yeah, I don't think it does on this cart. Yeah, sleep mode is not supported by this cartridge. There you go. And it just shuts the console down instead. Um, but on overclocked... That's a quirk I'm working on. Trust me. Oh, see? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Oh, making a fool out of me. Because this thing is currently overclocked and it's still running just fine. Well, I don't know what it is then. Something about those mods breaks compatibility. Oh, now it's overclocked. I don't think it was before. It's clearly not the clock rate that's breaking the compatibility, though. Interesting. Well, either way, I'll have to investigate that more. Um, I just think it's... I just thought it was worth sharing that these obscure cards do work. Um, this one has that lip. And so you have to kind of jam it in at an angle if you want to do it. But it does work. So I guess I'll close out my epic feature length review. If you can call it that.